But now I'm, I have the pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, Amy Harmon. And uh, 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 Amy is uh, a name that, uh, uh, that uh, many of you uh, know now in the melanoma community. Uh, she's come especially from New York just for this event. So we really thank her for, for doing this and spending time with us and being able to share her experiences. And uh, Amy was, is a journalist from the New York Times. Uh, she used to work for the Los Angeles Times, and she, uh, she lived here in, uh, in Silver Lake for, uh, for many years, and then she was recruited by the New York Times. She uh, won a Pulitzer Prize for a series that she wrote a couple of years ago on uh, the impact of DNA analysis on human disease, and a, a very interesting set of articles that you can find in the, in the New York Times uh, uh, website. And then she uh, wrote this uh, excellent series of, uh, uh, of studies, uh, or, or, of, uh, uh, of articles on, on melanoma. And she, was, uh, she documented things so thoroughly. It was amazing how many people she talked to. And many, uh, some of you are in, in the audience that, that she interacted because she wanted to really learn what's, uh, what's about this disease, uh, what are these new therapies, and how they're impacting. So we're honored to have uh, Amy Harmon here. And help me give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, let me see. How do I get my stuff up here? Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to tell you, at the risk of being overly candid, I rarely travel across the country just to give a speech. And I pretty much never, tra never travel to give a speech without getting paid for it. <clears throat> I have a really demanding day job, and this is not part of it. I have a young daughter and a husband who I'm away from enough already because of my real job. So I have a rule, no extraneous travel. But when Tony Rebus asked me to come speak to a group of melanoma patients and their families and friends and caregivers, I couldn't say no. Tony spent about 8,000 hours with me last year explaining to me the ins and outs of the biology of melanoma. <clears throat> I interviewed him by phone, I interviewed him by email, I visited his lab, and I interviewed him in person. He introduced me to his colleagues, Bartosz Chmielowski and Roger Lowe, who also devoted vast quantities of time <laughs> recounting their role in the promising beginning of what everyone hopes will be a true revolution in the treatment of melanoma. And it wasn't that I felt I owed them. After all, they did it because they wanted to raise awareness. But I, I too, felt invested in this rev revolution. As much as it is my job to maintain objectivity and skepticism at all costs, I am excited for what, by what I have had the privilege of reporting on here. And as much as I am grateful to the doctors and researchers who took the time to explain the science of it to me, I have been most humbled and awed by the patients and families who shared their lives with me at the most excruciating moments of their fight against this disease. I can't ever repay that debt, but if by sharing my experience as a journalist reporting on this medical frontier, I can in some way be of use to you, I was happy to fly across the country to try to do that. So that's why I'm here. Hello. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Um, now, as Tony just explained far better than I ever could, there have been two major advances in treating melanoma over the last year. I am only going to talk about one of them, the targeted therapy that he talked about too, but I'm going to talk about it in kind of a different language than he talks. Um, and you know, it's called vimerafenib, and I spent over a year talking to doctors and patients involved in its clinical trials. Um, it may be that the combination trial that is planned of it with the other therapy, ipilimumab, the other drug Tony discussed, will be even more exciting than what I witnessed. But what I witnessed was pretty exciting. And in a few minutes, I'm going to show you a short video clip of one of my favorite moments um, in the course of my reporting on this. But first, let me give you a little bit of the journalistic and medical backstory. Um, I started out in January 2009 asking the wrong question. I thought it would be interesting to write a story about what makes certain patients decide to join a clinical drug trial and others not. I imagine that this was a great, big, angst-ridden decision for some patients, and perhaps for some patients with some diseases, it is. But I pretty quickly learned that most educated patients 
with an advanced stage of cancer who are lucky enough to get themselves to a research center like UCLA will do anything to get on a clinical trial. The standard treatment for most cancers, and certainly for melanoma in January of 2009, was just not that good. If you have an advanced form of the disease, chemotherapy is not likely to cure you in melanoma or any cancer, um, or almost every cancer. Um, but in poking around for patients to talk to about this wrong-headed question, I stumbled across a trial that might be able to illuminate not just an important advance in the treatment of melanoma, but a sea change in the way cancer is understood and treated. Some people call it DNA diagnosis. This idea that melanoma or breast cancer or colon cancer is not one disease whose character depends on how its cells look under a microscope or which organ of the body it shows up in, but rather that each type of cancer as we have traditionally defined it is in fact many different diseases with different genetic roots. And that if you can pinpoint these roots, you have a much better chance of cutting it off at its source. I had, in other words, stumbled across the trial of the drug now known as Vemirafenib. At that time, it had only a code name whose first initials came from the small company that developed it. The company's name was Plexicon. The drug was PLX4032. But I think it's worth noting that for all of Plexicon's admirable work, the drug is really traces its roots back to work by the Sanger Institute in England in the late 1990s as the first human genome sequence neared completion. Scientists at Sanger decided to study tumor cells donated by cancer patients many years earlier and stored in databases around the world. And in order to really figure out which genes, gene mutations mattered in these cancer cells, they would ideally have samples of non-cancerous cells from those same individuals. Um, and it was so striking for me to learn this because at the risk of getting ahead of myself in this story, this is a lot like the basic strategy that Tony and Roger and others are using to try to build on and improve on memorafenib using tumor cells from patients who have relapsed after taking it and comparing them to tumor cells before the relapse. But back in England, <coughs> Um, it turned out that many more of these cancerous and normal pairings existed for melanoma than for other cancers because so many therapies, especially immunotherapies, had been tried in melanoma and had required scientists in the past to take the time to grow and preserve not just the cancer cell lines but the normal ones. So these Sanger scientists have a total of 40, cancer, 40 samples of different cancers and six of them were melanoma. And in those six, Mike Stratton, this, this guy at Sanger and his colleague found to their surprise that the same gene, BRAF, was mutated in half of them. And they actually thought, as Mike told me the story, that, that they had, that there was something wrong with the result. It was just like, it was too much, it was too striking. And so they, they did the same experiments again, and, and they found that really about half of melanomas had this BRAF mutation. Um, and that was really the origin of a drug that is now prolonging the lives, as Tony showed you, of, of many melanoma patients. That paper was published in 2002, and the chief scientist at Plexicon, Gideon Bolag, immediately began working on the drug that became vemorafenib, and it went into its first human trial um, in 2000, I believe it was late 2007. So at first, the drug couldn't be absorbed in high enough doses to get the kind of results that the oncologists leading that trial thought they should be getting. I mean, Tony sort of described to you the results, and it's, it's, you know, it's a really big deal in melanoma, and to think back on it, it, it almost didn't happen. Um, they were at this point, you know, they had selected for, for the first time in melanoma and for one of the first times for any cancer, they had selected the patients for the trial based on this very clear scientific rationale. They took a tumor sample before people went on the trial. They tested it to see if they had the BRAF mutation. About half of them did and half of them didn't. Those that had the mutation went on the trial. So they expected the people that had the mutation to respond and those who didn't have the mutation not to respond. But at this point, no one was responding, not in any really kind of significant way. And there ensued this whole struggle internally with Plexicon and the doctors involved in the trial and Roche, um, this, the pharmaceutical giant uh, who had by then taken a stake in the drug, about whether it was worth trying to reformulate this drug to get better absorption in the bloodstream so that they could essentially give higher doses of it and patients could absorb it, or whether they should just move ahead because they'd already invested all this money in the drug, co competitors were coming along, and they, they knew they could probably get a small result, not the kind of result they had thought, but 
it wasn't hard to beat decarbazine, the standard chemotherapy. So they thought, well, we'll probably get a drug that you know, could maybe still be a billion dollar drug, even if it doesn't you know, last for that long or help that many people. Um, and there was this, this internal struggle, and finally they decided they, they will reformulate it. <coughs> so um, well, let's see if I can get you my slides. Before I show you the video, I'm just gonna show you. Uh, oh, it's not, okay. This guy um, is Elmer Buxbaum. He was a patient at Penn, and he was 89 years old. And he was the first one in this trial to respond to the drug. And that was at the, in the late fall of 2008. Um, and they saw, you know, the, Keith Flaherty was, the, um, was his doctor, and he saw this response, and it was very encouraging. And they thought, well, maybe this, you know, maybe the reformulation has worked. But no one was quite sure what it meant. You know, it's what these doctor types call the N of one. It's just one example, so they couldn't, they couldn't like, you know, make any conclusions based on it. Um, but then um, more people began to respond. And I'm just going to show you this quick, this is a one-minute video. But this young woman is Carrie Adams. She's 30 years old here. She's in her home at Oklahoma City. She has, ha she has metastatic melanoma, and she's been through chemo and interleukin, and nothing has helped her. And all we know is her tumor has the BRAF mutation, and she's taking the reformulated Plexicon drug. And this is in early 2009. But Carrie Adams did not know this. I'm a horrible pill taker, so the first few times was just took me you know, 30 minutes to take them all. By the time she began taking the drug a year later, Roche had reworked the formula. She was given a more potent dose. And for two months, Ms. Adams took 28 pills daily. Then she went to her doctor for the first CAT scan results. And um, he comes in and he says, uh, okay, I think I've got some really good news for you. And I was like, okay, what is it? <laughs> you know, like just so excited. You know, he said that the, the scans showed a significant shrinkage in the size of all of the lesions. You know, he said, I think, I think we found the right drug for you. I think, you know, that we can look at this long term. She was not alone. Across the country, the phase one PLX 4032 patients were responding. What the responders shared in common was the same genetic mutation fueling their cancer. Okay, so, so that gives you some idea. And um, let's see. Uh, so it was kind of a thrilling moment for Carrie, and it was a thrilling moment for um, the five doctors around the country and one in Australia who had been recruiting patients for this trial and waiting and waiting to see what would happen. And Tony was one of those six doctors. And as it said, one by one. Oh. Um, they all began to um, to respond, and Tony had told the patient had had this patient who I got to know. He he already mentioned him, Mark Bunting. <coughs> well, he showed his um, cat scan, but I'm showing his face. Um, so that's Mark and his uh, his wife Trish and their three kids. They live near Salt Lake City in Utah. He's the airline pilot. Um, and you know his scans were just so amazing that when Tony emailed them to his colleagues, there was this great series of emails that I quoted in my story, and it was just really fun to see how these very careful, measured, buttoned-down scientists, doctor types, were like writing, you know, holy cow, <laughs> are, are you sure it's the same patient, question mark, question mark, question mark, you know, um, so you, you got a real flavor of, of their, you know, pretty rare excitement. Um, and I know that Tony, who uh, every patient I've spoken with is praised to the rooftops, is just the most compassionate doctor and um, was so happy to have something positive to report to his patients. <clears throat> I also know that he like all the doctors involved in this trial, had this horrible sense of foreboding about whether it was going to last. And that drove him and Roger to start working on, sort of immediately on determining what made the cancer come back. Um, and I, so I'm just going to read a short passage from one of my stories now that I think helps sum up both this concept of a DNA diagnosis and also what it meant for the patients on this trial. 
Um, this is from somewhere in the middle of my second story in the trilogy of stories that um, I wrote about the phase one trial. So <clears throat> here it goes. No one just knows, no one knows just what causes the single change in a single gene in a single cell that fuels a malignant melanoma. Randy Williams, now in recovery, had gone over in his mind a million times the day he fell asleep in the sun at the lake when he was 16. So I'm looking for Randy here. I thought I had a picture of Randy for you, but no, OK. Um, um, Randy, Randy Williams, now in recovery, had gone over in his mind a million times the day he fell asleep in the sun at the lake when he was 16. His feet were so badly burned, he could not walk for a week. 20 years later, a mole inside the arch of his left foot turned cancerous. Was that it? Was that the moment his fate was set? Because melanoma has been linked to sunburn, especially in childhood, many of the trial's participants relived such memories. Almost certainly, each had accumulated mutations in many other genes at other moments over the course of their lives. Some may have inherited a gene that was already damaged. Once unleashed, however, any cancer seemed to rely on the protein made by a particular mutated gene to fuel its wild growth. In all of these patients, that gene was BRAF, and whatever the cause, they came to consider themselves, so far it was, as it was possible with what has always been a virtually untreatable cancer, charmed. At least they had a chance. The patients took pills the size of large vitamins twice a day. Some gulped them down with water. Others spooned them up with applesauce. To get to the mandatory doctor's appointments where patients were given precisely one month's supply, Mr. Williams, a contractor with two teenage children, drove all night with his brother in a pickup truck. One young woman hopped corporate angel flights on private jets whose owners donated empty seats. That was Carrie, actually. Didn't name her there, but um, that's Carrie. Uh, Mark Bunting used his pilot privileges to commute to Los Angeles to see his oncologist, Tony. He says, Mr. Bunting told friends as his tumors melted away last fall, that I'm the leader of the pack. So that was just, um, but so in this trial, as Tony also showed you, almost every patient with a BRAF mutation saw their tumors shrink. Um, it was pretty glaringly obvious to anyone that patients who were at death's door were pulled back from the brink by this drug if they had the BRAF mutation. But I have to tell you that Carrie is a real outlier. I told you that this was the video I showed was the spring of 2009, and now it's the spring of 2011, and Carrie is still alive and taking the drug and doing really well. And I know that someone else in the audience has had a similar um, long-term response, which is um, so exciting, and I have to cross my fingers that it won't change. But the more typical end to the story is the patient's relapse after about seven months. And that is why there is probably more excitement about the immune therapy approach exemplified by ipilimumab, which Tony described. Because even though it helps far fewer patients, and you can't tell which patients it's going to help, at least for some of them, it seems to be a durable remission, maybe even a cure. But that is where the work that Roger and Tony and others around the country are doing with the participation of patients whose cancer is growing again. As, and as interesting as the first group of stories that I wrote on the phase one trial was, it was the last of the series that I thought was the most important and the most hopeful. I think I, I said in that story that Tony and Roger's work shows how much, what a Herculean effort it takes just to make a baby step. And it really does. There's just so much work involved in finding the, I mean, Tony described this to you a little bit, but I just, you know, the idea is that all these patients relapse, but they don't all relapse for the same reason. Um, there are going to be slices of different patients that relapse for the same reason, but they have to figure out, you know, which ones they are and then which drug. Um, will, you know, will help th them after they start relapsing. <coughs> so um, I'm going to end by telling you the story of one of those patients. I'm just going to digress very briefly because Tony brought up the fourth trial that I wrote in the series, which was about these two cousins. Um, and it's, it's a big topic, and we can talk about it in the q and I wasn't going to talk about it here, but this is Thomas and Brandon. And you know, I, I described to you the phase one trial, and then the idea was, well, we really have to, we really have to prove that this drug prolongs people's lives. Um, but um, Bartos and Tony and Roger were a few of the doctors who were willing to talk to me, to sort of go on the record to say that this was troubling to them. The idea that the standard phase three randomized trial had to be performed in this context, when they 
didn't have this thing that's called equipoise, this idea that, you know, they, they, it's a concept that says that, you know, doctors who are giving people drugs for a trial are supposed to really not know, like really believe there's a question to be answered in the trial about whether one drug is better than the other. And I think many doctors didn't feel that that, that, that existed here. So um, this is Brandon, who was randomized to the control group. He got the carbazine. <clears throat> and he was first cousins with Thomas, who got on the trial. Uh, he, he actually wasn't on the phase three trial, but he, he got the drug through, a, um, through another smaller trial that they were doing to sort of see how it combined with other drugs. And, um, and, he, and Thomas um, is still alive. He, I guess he, he actually is progressing now, but he was, um, had at least a year of extra life as a result of this. Brandon um, died very shortly after he started taking the decarbazine. Um, so anyway, I, I do want to end by telling you the story of Lee Reyes, who, um, Tony already showed a picture of him, but I have a picture of him here somewhere. Hold on one second. He, maybe I don't. Um, but Lee, I talked to Lee at the same time as I talked to many of the patients on the trial, at the beginning of 2009. And I was talking to all these patients. Um, there's Tony looking at looking through his microscope. I, I talked to all these patients um, because I was looking, as journalists often do, for like a great anecdote, the person who would be kind of carry my story and who would kind of wring people's hearts and you know, make them realize how awful it was that this disease you know, st often strikes so early. I, you know, maybe it was going to be a mother of young children or you know, an astronaut that <laughs> had trained all his life and then, you know, was struck by melanoma. I mean, not to caricature my profession, but we, we do look for kind of these extremes. And Lee, Lee kind of broke my heart because he basically said, so I was interviewing everybody, sort of trying to get their, their little story. And, you know, I said, well, what do you do for a living? You know, wh where do you live? What do you like to do? And he basically said, you know, he was 30. And he said, I, I really haven't done anything. You know, I just, I just thought I would have more. I just, like, I, I just haven't done much with my life. And it, he was feeling so sad at that, at that moment. Um, but before his death, he did something really important. He gave Roger and Tony a clue to why this drug stops working. Lee had to have surgery to remove a tumor in his heart, and he agreed to let them take a sample from that tumor to grow. And dozens of patients are doing this now. There's one in the audience, Peter Butterfield, who um, had a lung biopsy, even though he didn't strictly have to have a lung biopsy because it, was gonna, he, it, it could help Tony and Roger in their work. Um, and uh, Tony and Roger um, can tell you more about the science behind that. But the challenge is really to get enough biopsies and to get those cells to grow um, in a culture so that, that they can be compared to the tumor cells that they have from before they started growing. Um, and that the, the new driver of the cancer, the new BRAF, can be identified and you know, hopefully addressed by by a drug. So I'm just going to um, close by reading this passage from my story about Lee. Those who wonder whether a single patient can help cancer research should know the case of Lee Reyes. 30 years old when his advanced melanoma was diagnosed in early 2008, Mr. Reyes was distraught at how little he had accomplished. Introverted and a perfectionist, he had dropped out of college and lived with his parents in Fresno, California. He cycled through video game systems, favoring the Xbox. He loved flying and thought about getting a helicopter pilot's license, but never pursued it. For the better part of about 10 years, I did close to nothing, he said. I just always felt I had so much time. One of Dr. Rebus's first patients in the trial of the Roche drug, Mr. Reyes, was selected because he was among the half of melanoma patients whose tumors carried the overactive protein that the drug blocked. As it would for nearly every patient in the trial, the drug held his cancer at bay for several months. But as would happen with the others, his response did not last. With his life at immediate risk because a melanoma tumor had metastasized to his heart, Mr. Reyes, travel Mr. Reyes traveled to UCLA for surgery in May of 2009, agreeing to let his tumor be used for research. On Dr. Rebus's instructions, a technician stood in Mr. Reyes's surgery room and, as soon as the surgeon extracted the tumor, ran with it to the nearby laboratory to reduce the chance of exposure to contamination. To coax the cancer cells to thrive so that Dr. Lowe could run them through a battery of tests, it was sliced up with sterile knives and deposited in a flask with sugar solution in an incubator. 
On a visit to Mr. Reyes's room after the surgery, Dr. Rebus did not discuss the future with his patient. They both knew the options were limited. Instead, they talked of animals, Mr. Reyes's affinity for monkeys, he was clutching a stuffed one from the hospital gift shop, and Dr. Rebus's for sea otters. When Mr. Reyes died a few months later, Dr. Rebus called his mother to offer his condolences, as is his custom, and then he told her something else. He said Lee is helping them, Ellen Reyes told her husband. Mr. Reyes's cells were growing. Um, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can I answer any questions?